Welcome to everyone. Theology Live is a uh, title of the series of lectures for which we have invited Ron Sider, who will be introduced shortly by Chris Sharon. Theology Live, uh, that's not the only mode in which we do theology. And at YDS, we do what we might call the primary research, where we spend most of our time closed in into the kind of confined walls and lined up with great books and uh, study important and significant issues to great length and great detail. But that, too, is not the only mode in which theology is done. Theology is done also in an engaged mode, a live mode, as we have uh, uh, designed it uh, or named it in this uh, title of this series. And uh, if I think of uh, persons who have done uh, theology live, Ron's, well, uh, Ron Sider's name certainly comes immediately to my mind. So. Um, Ron is one of the persons in this year's uh, series that we, uh, we have. Others have been already here and more will be coming. Part of the, um, part of the uh, goal that we have for this year is to prepare for the conference that we are organizing on Moral Leadership Sarah Smith Conference, which will be entitled Crumbs from the Table. And you've seen some of you already advertisement for that conference. I hope all of you will come. Um, our interest there is the question of an issue of poverty, and we're is interested in that issue not just as a distribution issue, which it is, but also as creation of wealth issue, and we hope in this way to make a significant contribution to the way in which this topic is being framed uh, in smaller Christian circles as well as in the larger national debate. And this conference, as well as, um, uh, as, well as this series, is uh, sponsored by Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And I want to introduce to you uh, at least one new member of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, um, and that's Joseph Cumming. Joseph Cumming, here in the back. Some of you have seen already his face. He is directing, uh, not David. David, you know already, right? Uh, the one with the beard, uh, slightly Muslim looking. <laughs> And Joseph is uh, directing uh, our newly founded reconciliation program, uh, whose main emphasis is the relationship between Christians and uh, Muslims. We have one more addition to our team, uh, mostly doing primary kind of uh, research, uh, theology in a primary, uh, primary research mode, which is Travis Tucker, who is unfortunately not able to be here with us. So, uh, I don't want to speak much more uh, introducing the series and the, and the center, but I'll give it over to Chris Sharon, who will introduce in greater detail our distinguished guest graduate of this institution and read uh, small and this institution read large. Ron Sainte. Thank you. Thanks, Miroslav. A couple of comments about the um, occasion first. By the end of the presentation, there'll be some resources uh, from Evangelicals for Social Action and from Ron Sider's work generally, uh, in addition to some of his books. Uh, so you're able to pick those up. Some of the materials are free. The books are for sale, and you can uh, purchase those. And I encourage you to stop by and, and get one that, that uh, he can sign for you while he's here. As well. Uh, the bookstore manager, Lisa Huck, said that she would try and have some of his books out on display, so uh, you're welcome to look there as well. Uh, I also want to say that this is webcast, and so we're participating in this conversation, but others will be participation, par participating via the web now, and then it will be archived for people to take a look at later. So even though in, in our uh, effort to have a conversational hour, um, we would want to be informal. I ask that uh, for the sake of that webcasting, if, if uh, you have a question when we get to the question and answer time or the dialogue time, if you would go over to the mic that we have uh, and introduce yourself, say uh, either if you're a student, uh, what program you're in and your name, or if you're visiting, uh, what your other connections are, and ask your question. And that way, those who are um, viewing from the outside will be able to participate and hear everything. As some of you know, I'm a big U2 fan, 
And so I was, of course, delighted when Time Magazine decided to make uh, the group's lead singer, Bono, along with Bill and Melinda Gates, their uh, Persons of the Year for 2005. It's a good story about why the mega cool and the mega rich have teamed up to fight global poverty. Time Magazine summed up their reason for the choice this way, for being shrewd about doing good, for rewriting politics and re-engineering justice, for making mercy smarter and hope strategic and daring the rest of us to follow. Bill and Melinda Gates and Bono are Time's Persons of the Year. Many of you probably saw that uh, issue uh, on the newsstands. Well, today I want to suggest to you that, well, the Gateses and Bono have been uh, making fighting poverty and doing justice trendy over the last year or so. There are legions of people who've been working for decades to raise the question and to think through solutions, and perhaps none have spoken so clearly about God's claim on us to engage such, such work, especially those of us from the privileged uh, countries of the North Atlantic, as our guest today, Dr. Ronald Sider. In season and out, whether trendy or not, Ron Sider has raised a clarion call for Christians to examine their lives in relationship to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and his call to follow. And Ron Sider has consistently pressed the holistic nature of that call, to love God and the neighbor, to practice mercy and justice, to engage in social service and structural reform. Because of this work, Ron Sider is today one of the most respected and passionate advocates of holistic biblical faith in the Christian world. He's written many, many books and hundreds of articles and been a tireless advocate for these causes. As Miroslav noted, he was educated uh, here uh, at the master's and doctoral level at Yale uh, and grew up on a farm in Canada and has been working for many years at uh, what was formerly Eastern and now is Palmer Seminary in Pennsylvania. His groundbreaking book, Rich Christians in the Age of Hunger, has done something almost no theological or biblical book ever even hopes to, which has sold hundreds of thousands of copies and had impacts on uh, lives, uh, <laughs> including my own, <laughs> in committing to do uh, work that matters in the world. So it's with great joy uh, that we have Ron Sider here, and we welcome him now to come and speak with us about his topic today, How Do We Empower the Poor? Thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, friends. Uh, it's a delight indeed to be back uh, in familiar surroundings. I uh, appreciate very much um, this uh, invitation from Miroslav, who's been a friend for a lot of years. And uh, thanks to a newer friend, uh, Chris. What uh, Miroslav suggested uh, when he asked me to do this was to give a very informal kind of um, uh, talk. It's not a formal lecture. I don't have um, uh, a text here. I've got a few notes. And the suggestion was that I think about how do we move Christians to empower the poor, some personal reflections from my life. So that's what I uh, intend to do. I'll, I'll talk for, I don't know, 20 uh, or a bit more minutes, and, and then uh, we'll uh, talk together with whatever questions and comments that uh, you have. The first thing I th thought I would do is just very briefly sketch a bit more of my journey. When uh, I was here <clears throat> doing my doctoral dissertation with Jaroslav Pelikan and reading the 16th century German and Latin, you know, in the, in the uh, Beinecke Rear Book Room and all, I, I finally, in 1967, 68, decided I just had to <clears throat> become more activist and I went out and uh, organized a modest voter registration drive. Part of that was coming out of the fact that in those years, uh, the last two years we were here, I was uh, renting with my wife an apartment from an African-American couple. And he was working as a janitor um, full-time uh, downtown to clean dorms at uh, Yale College uh, for the elites of the world. And that didn't make enough money for a decent, modestly middle-class lifestyle. So he worked full-time in a second job literally working 16 hours a day. And we sat with that uh, couple the night Martin Luther King was killed, tasted their agony. Well, all of that uh, has certainly played into my life. From 68 to 75, after I'd uh, finished my uh, uh, 
dissertation. It was actually in the history department, but it was on Karlstadt, a theologian. I moved to inner city Philadelphia. Um, uh, a Christian college, Messiah College, was starting a second campus at the edge of Temple University's campus. And uh, for the next uh, seven years, we lived there, went to a black church across the street. Our kids uh, sort of integrated the local uh, school for a couple years. And I learned an awful lot. Um, in fact, most of what um, I knew when I wrote uh, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger in 76, most of what I knew about what it means to be poor uh, and to understand that in any kind of emotional, you know, serious, uh, personal way, I had learned from African Americans. Uh, I had not been abroad uh, more than about uh, five weeks uh, when I wrote that book on global poverty. In 1972, um, I did something that I don't talk a great deal about now. I organized Evangelicals for McGovern. Uh, as you remember, we carried the great state of Massachusetts and, and no other. But um, it was strange enough to uh, get some attention, even a story in Newsweek. The year after, I organized um, the Chicago Declaration, which produced um, the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern. About 45 uh, evangelical leaders, young and old, came together for three days over the Thanksgiving weekend, and we issued a call that uh, um, got some attention, pleading with evangelicals to get more engaged in questions of racism and economic justice, and um, even wonder of wonders, mutual submission between men and women. Well, in, in 77, I uh, uh, published Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. I uh, thought it might you know, sell a few thousand copies, and it kind of quite astonished me, and uh, uh, I've been uh, grateful for that, and in fact, in many ways, it's changed my life. Uh, opened up uh, doors, invitations um, of all sorts. In 77, 78, I began to get involved in the international Christian community, heading up an ethics and society uh, wing of the World Evangelical Fellowship, and getting to know your speaker for this fall, uh, Vinay Samuel, who's been a dear friend and colleague in a whole bunch of uh, projects since then, including um, the Oxford Conference of Christian Faith and Economics that ran from 87 to 90 and then 95, and um, uh, I'll say a little more about that um, later. Well, my life um, project, uh, in some way, uh, my mission, what I really felt called to especially focus on, has been to help Christians develop a better balance between word and deed. I'm passionate about evangelism. I'm passionate about social action. Uh, I think they shouldn't be separated as the church uh, in the United States um, and to tragic extents in other parts of the world uh, as they separated them in the 20th century. Next, let me um, talk about rich Christians, just a little more. Uh, that's obviously my most successful uh, effort at helping um, Christians become more engaged with poor people. It actually started uh, here at uh, Yale Divinity School. Uh, I was in the history department, but I moved up uh, to the Divinity School for three years, from 64 to 67. And in the, the last year, I filled in for a little Baptist church last year at, here at the Divinity School. Um, 40, 50 miles north of here, I forget even the town now. Uh, they, were, they were merging with another church and they needed somebody to fill in and preach on Sundays for um, seven, eight months. So I did that. And one Saturday, I decided I would preach on world poverty. So I, I did some biblical stuff, I did some factual stuff. And uh, as I was reflecting on um, the question, okay, what concretely do I propose? I always think that's an appropriate part of the sermon. I decided to, the idea uh, just came to me somehow, of a graduated tithe. Uh, the more income you make, the higher percentage you give to um, kingdom work. I proposed that. Uh, I don't remember any reaction whatsoever from the congregation. I'm sure no one decided to do it. But uh, it impressed my wife and I, and we decided, um, as I uh, left graduate school and started to make a little bit of money, that uh, we would try to practice that. A couple years later, um, well, several years later, I proposed a, an article uh, for InterVarsity Christian Fellowships, his magazine, called The Graduated Tide, and then I proposed after they published that that they let me do a little book, 125-page book, uh, 
called The Graduated Tithe. Well, when I wrote it, it became a different book. Uh, I was going to have one chapter on biblical stuff. It turned out to be uh, three and a half. Uh, like Topsy, the book growed, and uh, I gave it the name, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. It's the only time in my life when the publisher has accepted my title uh, without a word of uh, objection. <laughs> Every other time, you know, it's been a vigorous dialogue back and forth. But that one, um, that one worked. There are three parts uh, to the book. The, um, the first part um, is a description of poverty. The hard data, if you will, um, as accurately as I, I could get it, plus personal stories to provide power um, and motivation so that people can feel what it means to experience this level of poverty described abstractly by the data. And then secondly, there's a, a biblical theological section uh, that became, uh, I think, probably the best and most important part of the book. I've, I've done five editions, and the first and the third parts have changed a lot, but, the first, but that middle section on the biblical theological stuff has largely remained um, unchanged. And the third part is concrete proposals for what we do. And I move from one's personal life to the life of the church to changing the structures of the larger society. I think that in many ways, um, my whole life has been an attempt to work at a variety of issues using that basic approach of trying to get uh, the analysis right and uh, then trying to develop a biblical theological framework and, um, and then uh, saying, okay, what do we do about it? Let me talk about um, special instances in my life where um, I, I think I've uh, had some success at helping others understand poverty in, those, in terms of those three issues. First of all, the factual data and stories and experiences to grab the heart of people. The facts. Uh, now, I put that in quotes. We all know that um, uh, there are no pure facts or always interpreted data. But I am passionate still about trying to get as close to the hard data as possible. I don't ever claim to um, uh, get that entirely accurately, but I'd like to get closer and closer, and I work hard at that. I think the first edition was rather weak on that. Uh, I was here at YDS, for Pete's sake, uh, from 64 to 67, and I didn't, didn't take a single course in ethics. I didn't realize at that time that um, this is what I was going to be doing in life. I thought I was going to do something quite different. I took one course in economics, uh, an undergraduate course uh, in my whole life. So when I presumed to write on global economics in Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, it was more than presumptuous. And um, the economists had told me that I didn't do real well on that um, <laughs> part of it. Um, in fact, um, a friend now at Eastern University, the seminary is part of Eastern University, uh, tells me that uh, the first edition of the book he threw out the window, but uh, the later editions he, uh, he takes uh, much more seriously. I tried to get help with the economics, and I think that's important. The, the other part is trying to get through to the emotions of people. And in the book, I use stories of poor people. Um, I think that real life encounter is even better. Let me illustrate that from something I did um, in about 69 to 71. Remember, I was at an inner city campus of Messiah College. Um, except for Temple University itself, the whole area of North Philadelphia is uh, virtually 100% African American, was then, still is, um, essentially. And what I did was to have two-day weekend seminars for white, middle class, small town uh, pastors and bishops and other church leaders from mid-Pennsylvania. It was, it was only two days. Uh, I had them listen to a variety of African-American uh, uh, speakers, preachers, and, and others. Uh, they lived in an African-American home for one whole night. And I was regularly amazed at what just two days of walking the streets and looking into the face of, of African-American uh, preachers and so on did to their lives. Uh, it made a difference. Uh, they really uh, understood things in a new way. Um, you know, not total change, of course, but it showed me the power of firsthand experiential encounter. Uh, another 
illustration of that uh, comes from um, a, a very well-to-do businessman that I got to know after Rich Christians came out. And I discovered that um, what really changed his life was a walk in the slums of Lima. Um, he was on a fast track and, as a, you know, a football player at, I think, Ohio State. Uh, and then uh, went into business um, and uh, developed a, an East Coast company that was uh, one of the earlier fast food chains, made millions and millions of dollars. Was, uh, I think when he was 30, um, 30 or 40, I forget which, he uh, was on a trip to Latin America for the presidents, young presidents, of very successful American companies. And he was pretty seriously abusing alcohol. One night he drank himself fairly silly, uh, so much that he didn't wake up in time to go with the group on its regular scheduled tour for uh, that day. But uh, one or two o'clock in the afternoon, he finally sobered up enough to go for a walk. And uh, he got lost in the slums of Lima. Uh, he wandered for several hours. And it, in a very significant way, changed his life. When he looked uh, eyeball to eyeball into the face of poverty, it did something to him. It's out of this sense, uh, my own experience of learning from African Americans, uh, and later on, third world people, um, from face to face encounter, and then the kinds of stories I've just described, it's, it's that that has made me really quite sympathetic to uh, mission trips uh, from Christian congregations here. Uh, now, they can be just junkets, uh, but if they're done well, uh, they help young people look face to face um, in the eyes of poverty, and I think that makes a difference. Well, the second uh, uh, part of the book, and the second area where I want to make some comments, is the, the whole biblical. Um, theological grounding. I've lectured in uh, all segments of the church uh, over the last decades, the evangelical Pentecostal world, the mainline Protestant world, uh, Catholic world, black church. And when I'm talking on this kind of issue, I always <clears throat> have a strong uh, biblical component to what I say. And I think always it makes a difference. And, and really helps, sometimes more, sometimes less, but uh, it always, in fact, makes a difference. I think that uh, probably is especially true in the evangelical world. Let me just give you a few stories to illustrate that. About uh, 1979, I uh, was lecturing at uh, an evangelical college um, on the West Coast actually a, a college from the peace tradition. But uh, you wouldn't know it from the chaplain. I was invited in by, in an unusual way, usually of course, you know, president, dean or whatever invites me. But this time it was a group of radical seniors who were, had been fighting with the chaplain and most of the administration all the four years they were there. But somehow um, they were able to invite me and uh, so I spoke in chapel, um, and uh, did a bunch of classes. And the last day I was invited to speak to the chaplain's uh, religion class. Now you need to know who this guy was. He was um, uh, actually trained to be on one of the crews being prepared to drop the bomb on Hiroshima. And when they finally selected the final cruise, he didn't get to go. But even when I was there in 79, he still felt a little bad about it. He would have liked to have been uh, on that mission. He was a God and per country person. Um, he said to the class before I, I spoke, I, you know, in chapel, I said, God's on the side of the poor. I talked about structural injustice and the way Americans are involved in that. Uh, he listened to all that. Um, he said to the class before he turned it over to me, he said, you know I'm a God and country person. I wave the flag. He said, and this is a quote, I think, I can hardly believe that my country could do anything wrong. I gulped and didn't say a word. And then he said, but what Ron Sider has been doing here and saying here in the last two days has been grounded in the Bible. And I've got to rethink some things. And uh, I said to myself, wow. That is not unusual. That kind of response has happened again and again. The um, chair of the board of the Billy Graham Association, wealthy Boston businessman, uh, joined me in a consultation that I, uh, I chaired um, on um, 
living more simply. And in one of the committee meetings, the first time we met, in fact, um, he said, Ron, I've just been reading your book, Rich Christians. And he said, uh, I've been looking for ways that uh, you would twist the scriptures. I thought you would do that. He said, I can't find any. Now, he didn't agree with all my economics and my politics, but he was saying, yeah, yeah, the biblical stuff is right. The biblical stuff on the poor is really pretty powerful. In the Oxford Conference on Christian Faith and Economics, uh, which uh, Vinay Samuel and I uh, basically uh, coordinated, we had a meeting in 87, and then in 1990, we had several days at Oxford. And we were going to try to write a Oxford Declaration on Christian Faith and Economics, uh, a consensus document um, in the evangelical world. And we had a very, very diverse uh, group of people. We had extremely conservative uh, American uh, economists and uh, business people. Um, we had a Mennonite businessman from uh, Vancouver who owned, you know, the joke was, you know, you know half of the city. It, it wasn't that much, but he was very, very wealthy. And um, he insisted that um, the only significant way to help the poor is to spend more money and help the economy go around. And uh, buying another Jaguar was just as good as investing in uh, small loans for poor people. So we had, you know, a whole range of people, uh, uh, economists and ethicists and uh, business leaders from a variety of perspectives, third, lots of third world um, people. And I was flying across the Atlantic putting together the small group structure and thinking to myself, I don't know if there's anything we're <laughs> going to be able to say together uh, in this declaration. Uh, Miroslav was there and uh, gave an important paper. What happened was we listened to each other. We were all committed to historic uh, theology and we were all committed to the authority of scriptures. And in the course of the several days, we put together what, uh, at least I think, uh, and others have uh, said something of the same, is really a quite important, fairly substantial document on Christian faith and economics. And I think then our sense by the end of the meeting was that that was possible because of our common commitment to the authority of the scriptures. A similar kind of thing has happened uh, more recently to me. Um, kind of wonder of wonders, um, uh, I was um, able to co-chair a process in the National Association of Evangelicals. Uh, the, the National Association of Evangelicals, you know, is the, uh, is the largest network of evangelicals in this country, about 25 million um, people, and um, it's certainly not been left of center in its public policy work. I was asked to co-chair a process um, in which we would write a new document that would provide a framework for the NAE's public policy work. We worked over several years. We had uh, scholars writing papers from a whole variety of perspectives. We had more or less the range of views within the evangelical community on that committee. We uh, then uh, took the essence of those papers and put together a draft declaration. Uh, again, I wasn't sure at all that the range of people in that process would permit us to say anything uh, substantial together. But um, you can judge for yourself. Uh, it's now been widely uh, uh, discussed. Uh, the document is for the health of the nations, uh, a, an evangelical um, framework for civic engagement, something of, of that sort. Uh, on the the call to civic the call to civic responsibility, thank you. I, I only help do it. It's on the uh, NAE.net website. Thank you. It's um, a document that does say a lot of substantial stuff together. And in fact, I think moves uh, the NAE significantly um, in um, a broader, more holistic agenda. The interesting, probably most important thing there is that it says that faithful evangelical civic engagement must have a biblically balanced agenda. And the document says that um, if we claim to be Christians in our public policy work, then we have to ask, what does the Bible tell us God cares about? And the document says, well, looks like God cares about not just the family, but um, the poor, not just about the sanctity of human life, but um, creation care uh, and peacemaking, uh, economic justice, and so on. And therefore, 
faithful evangelical civic engagement must be concerned with this whole biblically balanced agenda. I have hardly ever um, found an evangelical who's willing to argue with me when I run that particular argument. Uh, it may challenge how they in fact vote uh, or how they in fact prioritize you know, what their public policy uh, engagements are, but when you run the argument that way, uh, it's, it's pretty hard for them to disagree. Well, the third um, area in the book, it's um, concrete um, suggestions. Um, it's fairly easy to agree on basic biblical principles. It's harder to agree on concrete steps to implement them. I think that's absolutely crucial. Uh, I always claim less authority for my specific proposals uh, favoring this legislation or, or that concrete kind of um, policy. But it does seem to me that it's absolutely crucial that we do that. And from my first sermon that I mentioned uh, on this topic in 1967 here in um, Connecticut, uh, I've always tried to include the concrete uh, suggestions. I think one of the really good ways to do that is to tell stories about good models. And I do that um, in Rich Christians. I've also done it in other stuff like uh, my book, Cup of Water, Bread of Life, which I, where I tell 10 of the best stories about ministers that are really holistic, combining word and deed. And most of those uh, have a strong engagement with the questions of poverty. I've continued to do that um, with my activist side, um, organizing Evangelicals for Social Action, working with Jim Wallace and Calder Renewal, and so on. Well, one final set of comments, and then we can talk together. And that is that I have tried in my life to do something that I really don't recommend uh, that many people do, but I do think that a few people uh, need to do it. I've tried to be a scholar, I've tried to be a popularizer, and I've tried to be an activist. I've uh, not written nearly as much scholarly stuff as I would have if I hadn't tried to do the other things, but I have done some of that. And um, I, a lot of my writing is popularizing Rich Christians or an Age of Hunger is, is not a scholarly book. Um, it's intended for somebody, um, anybody to be able to read who's got uh, a decent um, high school education. And then I've been an activist. Now, that's a tough set of things to put together. Um, if you have a Yale PhD and know how to do research, uh, you're constantly frustrated when you write popularizing stuff because you can never uh, read nearly all of the literature. Uh, you have to be very selective and you always know that uh, uh, you're writing before you have in fact appropriately you know, read uh, all of the uh, stuff that would be good to read. But I'm quite convinced that a few of us should do that. Somebody's gonna do the popularizing. In, in, in my community, the evangelical world, um, most of the people doing the popularizing are absolutely ghastly. Uh, and if um, scholars don't try to do it, um, people who don't know what they're talking about at all uh, will do it. Uh, and so it seems to me a few of us should, in fact, try to do that. I just uh, wrote an article for the Christian Scholars Review reflecting on my attempt to put those three things together. Well, those are a few uh, just... Um, rather rambling reflections um, out of my own life. Uh, I would be glad uh, now to um, talk with you about um, any questions, comments that you want to make. Yeah. Will you, just to reiterate, come up to the mic uh, as you have questions. And if, if you want to come up uh, and, and get in a line, that's OK. So we don't have to wait for each person to come up. But uh, feel free to introduce yourself when you speak at the mic. Hi, thanks for your comments. Um, I'm Dan Morris. Hi. Hello. Okay. I'm Dan Morris, uh, second year MAR student. And I was just wondering if you could tell us some of your favorite American theologians and also maybe you recommend some reading. Okay. Um, John, John Howard Yoder has certainly been um, very important uh, in my own life. I am a Mennonite, and um, uh, he's me, the... Chris, does he need a, need a mic for it to be picked up? Or he he has a, a lot of... Okay, sorry, I just want to make sure. Yeah. Thanks, sorry, Mom. Yeah. So I, I think that um, um, 
you know, Yoder um, is still um, very, very helpful. Um, I, I like the stuff that um, your good prof here, Miroslav, uh, does uh, very much. Um, I like um, a good deal of what Stanley Harvost does, uh, although um, for me, uh, it would be better if he didn't exaggerate uh, quite as much as he does uh, <laughs> and overstate. But uh, you know, the basic thrust of what he wants to say, I think, is uh, enormously, enormously important. Um, that would just be a, a beginning set of comments. If I had more time to think on that, I would certainly talk about more people. Uh, as Miroslav mentioned at the beginning, uh, my own work involves uh, Muslims and Muslim-Christian reconciliation. And as you probably know, the perception throughout the Muslim world, especially in the Arab world, is that uh, the evangelical Christian branch of Christianity is radically committed to one side in the Israeli-Palestinian struggle with no concern for, for Palestinians and also radically committed to supporting the war in Iraq and uh, President Bush's policies in the war on terror. Uh, what would you want to say to uh, uh, the Muslim public ab yeah. about that yeah. issue? Yeah. Well, that one's, uh, that one's really tough. Um, it's made worse by uh, some very visible people who say unusually stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> the, the heart of the issue for a, a large number of evangelicals is that there is a strong segment of the evangelical world that has a certain kind of uh, eschatology that leads them to not only think they can talk about the details uh, that are going to happen just before uh, our Lord returns, uh, but uh, that tells them that the founding of the state of Israel you know, was part of prophecy, uh, and it's God's will, uh, and um, that leads politically to a position where almost anything the Israeli government does uh, you know, is, is okay. I don't think we have hard data on how widespread that view is. Uh, it, it's certainly uh, a major hunk of the evangelical world. My guess is that it's not a majority, uh, but it's a very, very substantial uh, minority, if it's not a majority. Um, and that wing, you know, uh, uh, Falwell Robertson, you know, uh, worked very closely with the Israelis, the Israeli prime minister is calling, you know, um, they have absolutely no sensitivity to the questions of justice for Palestinians. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not there at all uh, myself. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, precisely as biblical Christians committed to justice for everybody, you know, we need to be even-handedly um, uh, talking about a two-state solution. Uh, yes, we want security and justice for the Israelis, and we want security and justice uh, for the Palestinians. And so I, I'd want to say to them, there is a big hunk of the evangelical world that is not where you think the whole evangelical world is. There was a conference um, in um, Washington about two years ago, a one-day event uh, that was co-sponsored, I think, by the National Association of Evangelicals and uh, Diane Nippers of the Institute on Religion and Democracy who incidentally was the co-chair with me the, the NAE process. Uh, and those of you who know her know that she and I are not at the same point politically, uh, to put it mildly. That conference was precisely in response to some of the really outrageous things that were said about Muslims uh, after 9-11. Uh, and the, uh, the statement at the conference and the, and the whole message was, um, we want to be fair to Muslims. We're opposed to, you know, statements that uh, that are demeaning and uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so there's there's a there's a concern within the evangelical world uh, on this point. 
I, I think it's simply true that um, a majority of evangelicals um, did, obviously they supported Bush, and I think they uh, carried over to um, uh, supporting the invasion of Iraq. Again, I, I wasn't a part of that. Uh, I disagreed, but uh, uh, that's the case. So there's a problem here, a big problem. And one of the things that I've been saying uh, vigorously um, to evangelical centrist leaders is that you have got to develop a major dialogue between the evangelical center and the center in the Muslim world. Uh, there's not a lot of point in, in talking to the kind of fringe liberal Muslims in this country. I mean, that's fine, but what we really need to do uh, uh, is talk with the, the Muslim center. And uh, I, I think there's a growing awareness that that's got to happen, and I hope and pray that, uh, in fact, it does. Uh, it's, it's just desperately urgent for global peace uh, that uh, that understanding develop. Good afternoon. My name is Eris Rivera, first year student. I'm really grateful to hear you speak today. My question is, um, in your opinion, how affected are churches today in empowering the poor, and what do you see as obstacles or shortcomings? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I wish I knew the answer to that. I've been trying to work at that for uh, 30, 40 years. And uh, sometimes I think I have some clues and sometimes I think uh, I don't. Um, I don't think that one pastor in 50, whether it's a pastor in a Catholic church or a very liberal New England uh, mainline Protestant church or a, an evangelical Pentecostal church, I doubt that more than one pastor in 50 talks as much about the poor as the Bible does. Uh, and um, that's especially problematic if, if you're an evangelical and claim to make the Bible your central authority. Uh, so uh, I, in my frustration occasionally, I, once I, I, I said our evangelical pastor is going to hell, you know, and went on to talk about precisely this disconnect. Um, there are substantial numbers of congregations but not nearly enough, uh, that are engaged in some substantial ways uh, with the poor. I mean, I can talk about uh, very wonderful networks of holistic ministries uh, that are combining word and deed uh, at the core of our inner city. Um, and uh, I think they do that best when they, in fact, do uh, uh, combine a, sen a, a sensitive friendship evangelism with a comprehensive um, program of socioeconomic development. Lawndale in Chicago is one of my favorite examples. $15 million a year program, a medical clinic with 25 full-time doctors, uh, you know, on and on, uh, job training, low-income housing, uh, renovation and new housing, uh, and so on. Uh, but they also invite people to faith, and, and there are thousands of people whose lives have been radically transformed, drug addicts, uh, all kinds of people. Um, and uh, so there are an increasing number of such churches uh, in that one network alone, Christian Community Development Association, which John Perkins heads up, uh, there are now 600 plus congregations uh, or, or local ministries. Um, you know, I, how would they do it better? Uh, I think a better combination of what I was trying to do in Rich Christians. Uh, you, know, you need to preach um, uh, about the, the biblical framework. Uh, you need to have places where your people learn about the reality of global poverty and domestic poverty. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced uh, that um, experiential encounters are important. Now the truth is you can get roughly the same kind of first-hand experience with poverty if you just grow across town uh, and spend a weekend with a, a Latino or, or African-American congregation, but it's probably easier to persuade your congregation if you're white to a suburban middle-class white to go to Guatemala uh, the first time. So uh, do that well. Um, do it in Guatemala. It costs a lot more, but um, it, it still can be a very important experience. Next year, you know, grow across town. Uh, <laughs> 
So that kind of experiential encounter, especially in leadership, I think is, uh, is enormously important. My name's Terry Hare. I'm a member of the community through my spouse. Um, and I'm wondering how we can teach our kids in Sunday school, for example, about world poverty in a way that doesn't overwhelm them and make them feel hopeless and that they yeah. can't do anything. Yeah. I don't know very well how to do that. I mean, that's, that's not an expertise of mine, to put it mildly. Um, but I think it's important. Uh, I've actually been approached by uh, uh, a younger pastor who's very, very good at youth ministries, uh, and we're talking about a kind of a youth version of my book, Rich Christians uh, in an Age of Hunger. Uh, I don't know how to write it, so I mean, he would have to do it. I'm, I'm hoping that that might happen. Um, I don't even pretend to know uh, how to do that well. Hi, Andy Thompson, uh, MAR in Ethics student. Um, how has the shape of poverty changed and, and the shape of work with poverty changed and consequently how has, has your message changed since 1977? Yeah, you think especially of global poverty or domestic poverty here? Um, in, I'm thinking particularly of global, but yeah, okay. I mean either. Yeah. In 1970, uh, about... Um, 31%, I think is the figure, 31% of all of the people in developing countries were chronically malnourished. Today, that's about 17%. Now, that's stunning progress. Um, the percentage of people who are poor in Africa is probably worse than it was. Uh, Latin America has remained about the same. The enormous progress has been largely in um, Asia. And I don't think there's much doubt, but that that's substantially related to the fact that a whole bunch of Asian countries, first the Tigers, and then China, Malaysia, you know, Indonesia, a whole bunch, uh, basically move toward market, uh, market economies. Uh, and the result has been an enormous increase in the production of wealth uh, and um, very substantial improvement uh, in the lives of many, many poor people. Now, there are lots of additional things to be said about market economies and justice, but that, um, that basic um, set of data, I think, uh, is one of the most important things. Uh, the second kind of thing that's changed is that um, um, private development agencies have learned the enormous power of uh, microloans. Um, you know, the Grameen Bank, um, uh, started by a Muslim, um, in the Christian world, uh, Opportunity International, um, uh, they're getting close to making a million loans uh, a year. Um, opportunity, um, you know, a dear friend of mine was you know, kind of at the center of starting that. He, he with his family, lived among uh, rural poor, poor people in Bali. And he discovered that if you made a $45 loan to a poor woman uh, who could buy a little stove and kerosene and, and flour and, and sugar and so on. She can bake bread uh, and pay the loan back, you know, in six months, you know, and that's just flour and all kinds of agencies are doing microloans. And uh, there's a general sense that that's one substantial piece of the whole thing. I think probably another part of what's changed is that the evangelical world that for several decades was only doing relief and development. I mean, World Vision you know, was a, basically a Korean orphans choir and two or three orphanages in Korea about 1955. It's now a $1.7 billion a year program. So there's been just an enormous growth of um, evangelical relief and development agencies. And they've, uh, they've moved you know, from just relief to sophisticated community development, and now are beginning to move into uh, deeper analysis and engagement with the structural questions, uh, including politics. The World Evangelical Alliance, which represents, uh, you know, it's the national evangelical fellowships around the world, 385 million people, um, 
they are now setting up MICA networks in a whole bunch of countries in order to try to help the United Nations reach its Millennium Development Goal of cutting poverty in half by global poverty by 2015. And they're dealing with structural questions, you know, trade, and debt, um, and, and so on. So there's been a growth in that community into the structural stuff. That's still not deep enough, but, but that's, uh, that's changing. Well, those would be just a, um, well, one more comment. That is that it seems to me that as we talk about global poverty today, we need to kind of balance two things. One is to not suggest that the whole thing is hopeless. Um, because it isn't, uh, first of all, I mean, the, the amount of money needed to dramatically reduce poverty is, is so small compared with you know, what we have in terms of, um, of um, you know, wealth around. I mean, the U.S. by itself, if it wanted to, could easily you know, provide the 50 billion uh, or whatever a year that the uh, United Nations says would dramatically uh, reduce poverty. Now, we're not going to do that politically, uh, but uh, you know, it wouldn't be a huge drain on our budget. We could do it. So the, the money's there. But the other part is we've made progress. Um, I, I talked about the reduction of people who are poor in developing nations. Another part is we've made enormous progress in terms of inoculation. Um, about 1980, uh, about 80% of the kids in poor countries you know, didn't get the basic inoculations. Now it's, it's reversed. About 80% do. Uh, so one could go on with a whole variety of things uh, where, in fact, we've made progress. Uh, the other side, of course, is we've still got 1.2 billion people in the world you know, who, don't, who try to live in a dollar a day. That's, that's unnecessary, it's immoral, you know, and we have to keep lifting that up. And there are another 1.8 billion that try to live on $2 a day. So you know, that's still almost half of the world's people trying to live on $1 or $2 a day. Uh, so we've still got a long way to go, but you know, we have made progress and we can make a lot more. It's a question of political will, and that's where I get back to the churches. I mean, if anything's clear in the Bible, it is that God is a special concern for the poor. And uh, I'm actually rather hopeful uh, that, um, especially in the evangelical world, something new is happening that is building to a major new concern for global uh, and domestic poverty. Let's take one more, and then we'll um, formally close, but you have time for people to talk uh, individually if they'd like to talk to study. Uh, my name is Ian Skalker, first year at MDiv, and uh, you talk about the importance in your life um, how, um, how with your first-hand experience of poverty, how that sort of changed your path. I was wondering if you could say something about the importance of um, your activism in opening up. My what? Activism, yeah. in opening up scripture and, and, and understanding theology. Um. It's a good question, an interesting one. How has my activism affected my biblical theological understanding? Um, it certainly, um, I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's over all of my life, it's, it's been a, you know, a constant interaction. I, I'm, I'm constantly going with the questions I'm now facing, uh, because my starting point is Christ is Lord of all, so I want uh, Christ to be Lord of every area of my life, and I think that should be true of all Christians. And so we've got to think through what it means to, uh, in fact, do that, and that constantly brings questions from your particular moment in time. And I'm, I'm, I'm constantly going back to the scriptures with those questions and, and trying to um, um, get um, answers to basic framework issues. Uh, and I'm also wanting to let the scriptures put questions you know, to um, uh, the modern context. Um, I suppose one specific example of how my thinking has changed um, as I've been engaged in this process is to compare chapter four uh, of the first edition of Rich Christians with uh, the last uh, couple. I, I think when I first wrote Rich Christians, I was somewhat close to, uh, although I didn't put this explicitly, I didn't even, I don't even think I believed it entirely, 
but I was close to the sense that um, the biblical demand for justice means, uh, or to put it differently, the, the biblically informed understanding of equality or equity would mean that everybody had more or less the same amount of resources. Um, as I have struggled with the world, thought more about that, read the scriptures some more too, I have actually become, and I say this cautiously, less concerned with the relative ratios between the 20% at the top and 20% at the bottom. I'm less interested in that than I am with the question, what's happening to the people who are poor? If it were the case that the best way to help the poorest, in fact, get out of their poverty would be to let the ratios get even a little worse uh, between the top and the bottom, um, I'd probably be willing to buy some of that. Now, the big qualification on that is that I think that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So in a fallen world, it's very dangerous to have very unequal amounts of power. So that, that qualifies what I've just said um, very substantially. But what that's done is to have me modify that section. And now in that chapter, what I say is I think I'm absolutely certain that the biblical demand for justice at least requires this much. And that is that every person in family have access to the productive resources so that if they act responsibly, they can earn their own way, be dignified members of their community, you know, and contribute to their society, and certainly get out of poverty. That means that uh, my understanding of uh, equity demands an equality of opportunity up to the point where everybody could earn their own way and be dignified members of their community uh, and, and be well out of poverty. But I don't think that, uh, in fact, I, 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 I think that equality, absolute equality of income is, is, is not um, uh, either the moral demand or desirable. I think that people make bad choices um, and there is a, there's a consequence to that, including an economic one. Um, uh, so that's, that's a, an example of, of how uh, my struggling with this issue, dialoguing with people, continuing to um, read economics and the Bible has resulted in a modification. I think a substantial one, but uh, I wouldn't want to overstate it. Um, um, and I think that even though it's a somewhat modest demand, namely that God demands that we create societies where everybody has access to the productive resources, you know, as I said, uh, that may be modest, but it requires one heck of a lot of change in every culture I know. Uh, inc including this one, uh, if we were to be serious at all about implementing it. Okay. Well, join me in thanking Dr. Okay.